Happy New Year, and thank you very much for uh, tuning in and joining us. Uh, my name is Jay Hodges. I'm a proud friend of Sinn Féin's. Uh, I am very happy to be back uh, sitting here doing these interviews and, and having these discussions. And uh, we're going to kick 2022 off uh, with the myth, the man, the legend, Belfast's own uh, Fra McCann. Fra, I, I can't thank you, first of all, enough for joining us. Uh, and, and I'm going to be a little bit selfish uh, when, when we do this interview because your life is, is 50 years of activist community engagement community service. Um, you, you have led an incredibly colorful life and, and we don't have time to do it all. So I'm going to apologize to the audience, uh, but I'm going to bogart um, quite a bit of this because what I really want to talk to you about today is uh, you were you you were taken to the States and, and did a tour of the United States. So you have a different knowledge and a different story than anything else that we have heard leading up till now. Uh, and I am so excited to be able to get to that and to talk about it uh, and to kind of uh, let people know that because I'm fairly certain that most people in the States don't actually know that that tour went on. Um, so to do that, to, to do it all, um, we're going to start by uh, welcoming you and then asking you just to talk a little bit about where you're from. Like most people aren't going to know your name. And uh, I'm curious to kind of, you know, where you grew up, where are you from, um, just all the, the basic stuff. Well, uh, obviously, my name's Fran McCann. I was born in Belfast, uh, the market area of Belfast. Um, I lived with my mother and father, and at that time, uh, two of my sisters. I have to say that I come from a family of 10, uh, but at that stage, our family uh, lived in one bedroom of a five-bedroom house. It was a lodging house in Belfast, and uh, it was the only house, uh, properties available. At that time, uh, I lived in the market for about five years. And then uh, my father's from the falls. My mother's from the market area, two nationalist working class communities. And uh, we eventually, when I was about five, moved to the falls. And there I spent my life uh, in an area called uh, the Pound Loney, which was an old, old area in, 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 in Belfast. So it had been completely transformed uh, from, from then. Uh, but uh, I went to the local uh, primary schools in Congols. I went to the local secondary schools in Peters. And uh, I had a, a, a normal childhood. I was the oldest of 10 children. And, uh, and uh, obviously for many niceness, life was difficult, especially for my parents, uh, economically, you know, because jobs for niceness were very scarce in, in Belfast. And uh, so... Uh, Used to, people that talk about we talk about poverty, you know, we didn't know we were on in poverty because everybody else was in poverty. Sure. And uh, when 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 we went to school, uh, when I left school, I um, I got a job in a hotel, uh, and from there I went then to uh, work as a dispatch uh, person in the local Irish newspaper, at the Irish News, and I worked there for 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 a while. Uh, in the midst of all this, the area that I live in uh, was attacked uh, in August 1969, uh, where uh, thousands of unionists or those that class themselves as loyal to the British uh, attacked my community and a number of our communities. Uh, they burned quite a number of hundreds of houses. Uh, there was a number of people who were shot dead uh, by the loyalists and uh, the, their police force. And uh, so uh, from then, that was near enough life chains or life stat uh, for uh, many people who were young, they were looking forward to getting a job, they might have been looking forward at one stage getting a couple of pound or traveling. Uh, and uh, that, that, that took you through. Uh, there was barricades that sealed off streets that led them um, the main roads in my area uh, to try and uh, Stop for their attacks. The British Army had marched into uh, West Belfast or the Falls at that time. And uh, so that was what we lived with uh, for uh, a number of months before the barricades came down. I now, think. And, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but is this, is this time period in, in 1969, um, is this kind of what spurs you into action? Is this kind of what catapults you in? 
it had it had a huge uh, a huge impact on my life. Uh, and at that time, the the, the Republicans had uh, started to become more active, uh, and and Irish Republicans that is, and uh, the, the, and especially uh, in the, the war against the British. Uh, I uh, was only about sixteen at this time. Um, then uh, through from there uh, until say May nineteen seventy. Uh, the British threw a, a curfew on in the community I live in. And there was 3,000 British troops cordoned off this area and fired uh, literally hundreds of canisters of CS gas. There was three people shot dead. Uh, and that again strengthened my resolve to become involved in, in, uh, in, the, in the struggle. Uh, a short uh, year, so a year later, uh, the British introduced internment and uh, where hundreds of people were dragged off, arrested and interned without trial. Many people were shot dead by the British uh, in, around, in around that period. A big lot of the action took place in the community that I, that I lived in. And, uh, and so it was about that time I'd been too young uh, at that, the, 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 the make a decision to go in. So I joined the Fianna Run, uh, which would have been where young people would have went into and then from there graduated into the, the, the IRA. And some months later, I joined the IRA and uh, became active, a Republican activist uh, involved in struggle in, uh, in, the, in the, the falls area of West Belfast. Now, you're arrested for the first time in, in 1972? Is that, is that a bit? Yeah, yeah, I, I've been arrested a, a number of times in the least right away, you know, that, that you sure. know. That, uh, taken away from interrogation. Uh, but just after Bloody Sunday, uh, and, and I think it was uh, the 9th of, 9th of February, uh, I was arrested in Divis Flats, which had a, it's a huge flat complex sure. uh, at the, and that had replaced the Pound Loney. I was arrested there along with two comrades, and uh, we were taken away for three days interrogation and uh, suffered uh, beatings. Uh, with well, well, thing after that, we were moved from there to a prison ship, uh, which was docked in Belfast Harbour called the prison ship Maidstone, which was an old military ship uh, that had been had some renovations to hold uh, uh, Republican prisoners uh, who were interned. And, and you're, you're how old? You're like like eighteen. Yeah, but it, just before my eighteenth birthday, it would have been nothing. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think what I've been moved. I spent twenty eight days on the ship, and after that, I was moved to Long Cash, uh, just outside a big prison internment camp, just outside Belfast, and I spent two months there. And uh, after which, uh, I was released, uh, and I went got back into uh, the the, uh, the 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 struggle uh, for national liberation. And in, uh, in, 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 in the north. So you are, uh, what gets me the most about this portion of your life is, is that in the States right now, most of most 18 year olds are looking at college. Uh, that's, that's what they're looking at. Like they're looking at, you know, what they're going to do for the rest of their life and all the rest of that. You and your generation um, um, coming out of Belfast at that time has gone through a couple of years of of torture and and terror uh, by um, by the British agents who are there, and then you have gone into jail and you've come out of jail and you've gone right back into service. Like you, there wasn't a um, you, you didn't come out of jail and say, you know what, I need I, I need to figure out a different way to do this or or something else. Like you went right back into service. Yeah, probably, and I know it's difficult to believe when I write back my mother's uh, house and thing. Uh, several friends called to see me uh, uh, an hour later and uh, I went away off with them and had reported back uh, the, the day I got, a, uh, got released. Now, you are arrested again um, shortly thereafterwards and, um, and sent back to, to Mays, correct? Well, I was arrested in, uh, in November 1972 again. I'd spent six months out, and it was a very, very heavy and intense period. 
in the struggle mm -hmm. uh, in, in, uh, across the North and Ireland. And uh, that uh, I then, uh, in total, uh, spent uh, I, uh, been about three years and two months and turned. Now, uh, while I am anxious to get to the part where we talk about your visits to the States and, and kind of what went on there, uh, I, I feel like I would not be doing anyone any justice if we did not talk about the escape that happened in 73 um, and kind of what had gone into that. So can you tell that story? Well, it, 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 was, it was October and then November 1974 uh, that we were, I was in a, a, a compound called Cage 5. Uh, I was uh, with a, quite a number of other uh, comrades. We had a record in the cage of digging tunnels to try and escape. And uh, uh, after, during this period, I think it was the 14th or 15th of October, uh, the, the Republicans had been fighting and arguing about the conditions within the compounds that we were in. And uh, the, 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 the camp was burned, burned by the Repub Irish Republican prisoners. Uh, to highlight the, the injustices of internment, to highlight the beatings that were taking place, or the, uh, the, 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 the among the sentenced prisoners. And then, so after two or three days, uh, we were in, in our compounds, the huts had been burned, we were sleeping under pieces of corrugated iron, uh, uh, the, 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 especially uh, because of the weather, and uh, the RA and the jail had uh, uh, sent an instruction round that uh, people should look at uh, escaping as they can from the conditions that they lived in. And us in Cage 5, myself and other comrades, haven't had a history of digging three or four other tunnels uh, to try and get out. Uh, had, <coughs> had the experience of uh, how, we, how we done that. And I think it was about uh, maybe the 16th of October, 1974, that we began, now the, the, there was little uh, huts in the way of uh, shelter and anything like that there, but one of the huts, part of it was still standing. So we used that uh, to dig down, uh, go through the concrete that, uh, that layered the hut, uh, the, the, down into the, uh, the, the, the fill underneath it, and we started digging that out. Uh, and th th to be honest, at that stage, I was about, about seven stone seven at that time, young, fit and, and the thing. So when you got down through the concrete, at one stage before you, we dug uh, what became known as a shaft uh, within the tunnel, sometimes they would have held you by the legs and you went down and you were digging the things just to make it safe and easy for people to get down and sit to be able to dig. So what you done is you pointed, the, pointed in the direction that you needed to go and we were heading towards the motorway as long as we got out of the prison. And uh, we started digging. Now, it was difficult uh, times because you had many collapses. Uh, the, the, one of the funny things that happened during the, the early stages is that the prison uh, warders uh, that they had were not allowed in this, our, our compound. And uh, the, uh, the, what, what they were allowed to do was to check the wire every morning and every night. They'd walk around with the OC or the officer commanding the IRN in the, in the, in the prison. So what we had done is that we were digging down and we had about 20 foot of the tunnel dug at this stage. And uh, the OC of our, our compound went over to the, one of the chief prison warders and says, look, a couple of my men have been injured. They have, uh, there's cages, complete darkness. They fell over things. Your mom, they were obviously trying to get some relationship with us. And the, the prison warder said, what is it you need? He says, 200 foot of bell wire and uh, maybe uh, 20 bulbs in the connections from and things like that. So a couple of hours later, this, the prison warders are wait, wait in with all this stuff. And of course, a couple of electricians in the cage connected at the, 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 the electric in the jail and the prison. And we put it down the tunnel, to light up the tunnel as we were digging it uh, on the way out. You know, and, and the tunnel, we shored up part of the tunnel. Uh, and uh, with corrugated iron sheets with pieces of wood to hold it up uh, in the place. And, uh, and but a, a lot of a lot of times you were hampered by the re continuous rain at that time of the year. And uh, so you had collapses in the tunnel. At yeah. some stage we took a decision 
uh, to stop putting the shores up uh, the, the, the Cape River, and we just dug away. Uh, we finished the tunnel uh, in around the uh, 4th, into the 5th of November. And then we dug 24 hours a day. You know, we done it in shifts. We were constantly down it. Uh, and the, the, the ARA and this, the, 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 the compound, obviously, uh, and, and communication with the, 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 the other uh, members of the ARA and the jail uh, had, or in the camp, had uh, decided what way it was going to work. There were a number of people uh, who had uh, came over uh, into the compound uh, to, to just shortly before it. They were uh, needed out uh, by uh, the movement, the Republican movement outside. So they went in the first squad, about eight people. And uh, I went in the, in the, in the second squad. They, uh, uh, there was about eight of us there. And uh, we had come up, when we first came up, we came up on our side of the wire, which meant we thought we were going to have to, uh, to, uh, to, to cut the wire. We had a couple of uh, smaller uh, wire cutters had been hidden in the, the, the compound. So we'd got them and uh, we're going to go down. But a friend had dug on out and it collapsed. So it, it, it opened up a hole just outside the wire. And uh, that's how we got out. We sent three people out first. And uh, we, they, they were there, and they took the two wire cutters to cut wire, and there was any pieces of wire around about. We had this conception of what it was like outside the prison. Uh, we didn't know. Uh, we believed that there were small barbed wire fences all over to try and stop people uh, once they once uh, they, they 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 got out. Uh, so they they had well, there was actually four. They were going different directions to, to the cut the thing. The first squad went out. Uh, they went across the road. And I have to tell you that when I went out, uh, came up, when I put my head above out of, out of that hole, it was the most amazing feeling that you got. You were free, or you believed you were free. So you got up on the a grass verge and you crawled out. You crawled across what was a, a road round the whole present camp. And I crawled across the road and went into a ditch, and uh, the first squad was still there. So we hugged each other, shook hands, and then we went off. Uh, so the, as we got across the, 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 an open area, uh, we came to another small road, and on the other side was a farmer's fence. And uh, we were laying on top of each other, trying to get through this piece of wire. And next, next uh, thing we heard was shouting, and two shots. And uh, the guy, uh, Land beside me uh, was shot dead by the, the the British Army. Another one, another friend was uh, grazed at, at that time. Um, the they had come on across. It was a couple pulled on through and got out into the long uh, grass or whatever it was in the field and started making their way uh, towards the motorway or to the place where we were to meet. And I, but there was seven of us caught, and we were lying there along with ARA volunteers. Uh, Q Cooney's remains and then we didn't know at that stage we all jumped up and went over and then and obviously the, uh, at that time we were, uh, we were traumatised and uh, one of our comrades had just been shot dead another one slightly injured uh, they made us lie in the middle of the road uh, the, this road uh, the, they, what they were shouting is star yourself in the road when we done that uh, they were coming out around kicking you and beating you but there, initially, there was a, this big uh, British soldier with a huge Alsatian dog, uh, and the, he was had a long lead or an attached lead, and he would let it go, and the dog would come over and bite you in the arms or pull you and things like that. So uh, I always remember a British Army officer coming and saying, "How many dogs have you got?" He says, "Available." He says, uh, "He says of six or seven. He says, "Well, get a dog for every one." And uh, no matter when, they came back with these dogs. And uh, so and, uh, the, the end result, besides the beatings, besides the thing, I ended up with 27 dog bites uh, and the thing. So they got a, a van uh, uh, pulled up. Uh, we all got into the back of the van and uh, they put Q's body in and uh, they threw the dog into the back of the van that started biting us and, 
uh, again. So they, they drove us around the cells and that was our part of the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the escape over. They had caught a, a lot of people uh, coming up out through the tunnel. Uh, <clears throat> the ones that got out in front of us uh, went out first. They heard all the screaming and shouting and shooting and they dug themselves, there was a small stream. Uh, three of them dug themselves into the side of the stream and lay there for 24 hours while the search is scaled down. And unfortunately, they made their way towards Belfast and uh, they were caught about a quarter, half a mile from Twinbrook, which is a big nationalist area in West Belfast. There were seven others caught in uh, Hillsborough. And uh, that, that was it. We were all charged with escape. Now, uh, I want to get to the blanket because the blanket directly leads to, to you coming into the States. Um, so uh, in... 1977, you are, are you transferred or are you rearrested? No, I was rearrested in November 1976. Okay. Uh, I'd been out again about 10 months, 11 months. Uh, and again, and, and brought the Castle Ray Interrogation Center uh, and was badly beaten uh, there and uh, charged with uh, uh, ARA membership and possession of a weapon. Uh, I uh, and I was in remand in Belfast prison uh, for about six months, and I was uh, sentenced to three years. And uh, because I was doing over under four years, I was taken taken from uh, uh, the the courthouse directly to the punishment block in Belfast prison, and uh, there I was to spend. Uh, the next 17 months in solitary confinement naked along with four or five other friends. Uh, they had staggered the sails uh, so that you couldn't communicate with each other. Anywhere they were bringing us outside the cell, we had to go naked. Uh, that most of the, the, the time, well, all the time the, the, the cell was freezing. Uh, that three out of every 14 days you spent in what was called as an, an, the, an punishment where they came into the cell and pulled you out naked in front of the governor of the prison. And he would sentence you to 14 days loss of privilege, 14 days loss of remission, three days number one diet, uh, which I believe at that time was uh, may have actually under the European Convention was illegal uh, because it's a starvation diet. And then, so then three days you spent completely naked uh, from seven o'clock in the morning to eight, eight o'clock at night with nothing in the cell. So, uh, you could just cap on the, the move around the cell to try and keep yourself warm. Uh, and about August 1978, um, uh, we start we took started taking part in the No Ice protest. And uh, within hours, we were moved from there to, to the the the, the hits blocks. Uh, I was put uh, we were all put in the hits block four after a few days. Uh, three of us were transferred to H3. And uh, there, the, 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 the beatings and the torture and the conditions were really uh, difficult. Now, when are you released? I was released in this November 1979, 23rd of November. So roughly how long uh, had you been on the blanket and on the no wash at that point? Uh, well, I was on the blanket for two and a half years. Okay, for two and a half years. I uh, Just before we start talking about you coming into the States, um, we could spend an entire interview just talking about the different segments of your life. What astonishes me when you tell your story um, is the number of, uh, the number of times that you reference uh, beatings and uh, being assaulted and being tortured and and you know having all these things happen and yet uh i i always love your laugh like you are it's an incredible um story of resilience of a man uh to be real candid and, and i hear it time and time again no matter who we talk to but it, it really is uh, a very impressive testament to you as a person that going through all of that you didn't, you, I have never heard you become bitter or be angry. And I've watched several interviews you've done. Like, it's not ever that you come out and, and 
shake your fist and scream bloody murder. Like you, you have always maintained a very positive um, outlook on just the world itself, which I just think is an amazing thing. I, I, I wish I could say that I knew I would be that strong and I don't think that I would be. I think I would be extremely angry and extremely bitter. Um, and I, uh, I applaud you for your, uh, for your, your character. Um, but when you are released in 79, you immediately uh, are, are picked and, and chosen and sent to the States. And that's really what I wanted to get to today because yeah. the story is great. Um, so let's, let's talk about that. Like you, how did you end up, how did you end up being picked? And then how did, how did that whole story kind of go? And then, you know, let's, let's get into talking about how you came into the States. Well, to, to see just all that, you know, it, it was always believed that uh, if you were ever to break the protest besides uh, what was going on within the walls of uh, the, the, the H. Blacks and Armagh prisons, well, where the women uh, were housed, uh, was that America was crucial uh, to breaking this and, and uh, getting the Brits uh, to, to, to uh, agree to the five demands that prisoners had, had set out. And uh, it was always believed that 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 that, that was the case. So Kieran Nugent, who was the first uh, person uh, on the blanket, uh, Kieran's now passed. So he has he passed away a, 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 about ten years ago. And uh, Kieran, uh, being the first, went over to America uh, when 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 he got out. And there was a trickle of other prisoners who had got out, uh, who had done the same thing. Yeah, your 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 spawn in the, in America was short because uh, you the, there was an effort put in to try and arrest, especially in my understanding is that the British Information Services and 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 the America had been putting pressure on uh, the the American government to get what they call these illegal ARA terrorists or whatever uh, out, out of the country. Uh, so it, you were always on, uh, understand that you could be arrested at any time, and obviously you had to make it difficult for anybody to arrest you. Uh, and the thing, so uh, I, I had uh, I had arrived in America via another country, uh, and uh, that uh, I'd been held for forty eight hours in that country uh, for uh, and then and had been uh, granted a visa. Uh, for 28 days as a holiday visa and uh stay in that country yeah to okay. stay in that country yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you can imagine if it went and says uh got stopped and says no i'm just going to the america tonight i'll live I'll be there right no but we 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 uh myself and another comrade uh our friends of the struggle had uh brought us in that night and uh we were in Buffalo uh, overnight met quite a number of people from the Irish community, and then we went into New York the next day. And believe me, that blew my mind. And I know, you know, uh, uh, the the only time I'd been out of Ireland uh, was to football games in Scotland, and uh, to stand in the middle of uh, Manhattan in New York was the most amazing thing that I ever felt in my life. You know, the huge buildings that I'm very lackadaisical slow and and life and the, the speed that people were going and you know just blame my mind some great people well and uh i was going to say when i was um thinking about you and, and kind of doing this like at this point in time you're you're mid-20s ish yes. uh but you've you've been in prison for uh off and on uh and for about a decade um and you've got you know all these other experiences but you have never been on a plane uh, you have never, um, you know, so getting, you know, flying over and, and, and getting, you know, getting into the States is one thing, but then to be, you know, in New York and to have that kind of environment when you're kind of fresh at that age, like that's just a, that's just a crazy thing to, to think about who all were you not, not specific people, but like, who all were you meeting with? You know, here in the states, because you were drumming up support, and and it's important to note at this point in time that you you had just you were the first guy to come off the blanket that had not had the mandatory haircut and you know beard shaves and all that stuff. So you were 
you were the living embody of what the, the blanket protesters looked like, which for an American audience would have been extremely shocking in my head. It may not have been, but in my head, it would have been extremely shocking to see um, just kind of going on. So, you know, what was the reception like? Who were you? Well, what, what, what you told is that uh, obviously it would have been difficult to wear at, at an airport with a hurt on your shoulders and your beard Cheers. on your chest, you know, so you modified yourself. Uh, to suit the circumstance, sure. and uh, and uh, when we got in, when we started telling our story, that had a huge impact uh, on, on 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 people. Now, the the I travelled around Ireland for a number of months after I got released for other uh, released prisoners, and uh, you were you, you you think you're traveling distances, but when you go to America, you know that so many time zones. Uh, so many media outlets, you know, uh, the only way that you can break through all the, 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 the smaller interviews in the, in the local papers, uh, the more localized papers, was brilliant. But what you had to set your store on is, is how can you get into the bigger media outlets and, sure. and, and the thing. So uh, what we started to do is that when we arrived in New York, it was four of us, I think, at that time. And uh, I was dispatched off to uh, San Francisco. And uh, at the time, I didn't know who I was going to meet. Uh, it was, you're right, it was the second airplane I was ever on in my life. Uh, I arrives in San Francisco. I walks out, and obviously my hair is relatively long, and I have a beard, and, uh, but I don't know who I'm meeting. And I'm looking around the crowd, and I'm convinced that everybody's a member of the immigration or, or FBI, you know? <laughs> and uh, you keep watching. And I've seen these two people standing with copies of uh, Foblack, which is the Irish Republican paper in Seal and Ireland. And uh, you're even saying to yourself, is this a setup? Is this a setup? You know, it's just the way your, your mind operates. And they looked at me and I looked at them and went over by that. And that, that was my contacts. And I got brought uh, uh, into San Francisco and we went round in to meet a person in a place in and it uh, uh, happened to be a bar and uh, and, the, and the thing. So uh, what they had set up, uh, there there was a, a, a guy called Warren Hinkle, uh, who uh, was one of the main com columnists uh, for the San Francisco Chronicle. And I met him as soon as I got off then, and I done an interview with him uh, right away. And... Uh, we had a couple of uh, breaks, you know, there, there was a, uh, we'd been finding it difficult getting to get interviews, especially with the, 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 the people we needed to do them with. And there was a place called the Delancey Street Forum uh, that was in San Francisco and it was a huge uh, axe prisoner uh, organization that looked after people when we were coming out of prison. And, uh, the the guy I, uh, uh, I just forget his name. Um, I know you call him Matter, and uh, a friend who was looking after me in San Francisco had asked for a meeting with me. Went in, and uh, we ex just explained what what was happening. And he says he says, "Well, what do you want me to do?" He says, "We need press," and he says, "Give me ten minutes." And he came over and he says, "You have an interview tomorrow. You have an interview tomorrow afternoon. You have an interview with me," and that changed. A lot of stuff in there in San Francisco, and it, so I, I, I went into Los Angeles, uh, done a number of inter interviews in Los Angeles, and that's what it was all about. I was trying to get, and we were speaking to crowds of people, uh, in the in the in the different cities. We were traveling outside in the different uh, parts of the city, smaller parts of the city, and uh, doing interviews or or meeting crowds and doing public meetings. And, it, and uh, after I had finished that, I went back to New York again. And then within days, was dispatched off to Pittsburgh, back again, dispatched off to Boston, back again, down to uh, Dayton in Ohio, and uh, done, the, done the same bar. And you just kept uh, day on day going out, out, doing interviews, meeting people, meeting politicians, meeting uh, like. <clears throat> And uh, the, 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 you started to see more and more on about the conditions. Uh, some journalists, I think, had came to Ireland and, and got into the blocks, uh, the British had let them in. And uh, the conditions that was in it uh, started to, uh, 
uh, to have an impact. The, pro the campaign was building in Ireland, but it was also building in uh, the USA. Now, uh, and then, in your opinion, uh, or, or what was your opinion kind of with, like with the American audience and then becoming more and more receptive, like how has that kind of contributed? How has that kind of helped? Like how does that kind of move things forward uh, as we move more towards a, a united Ireland and, and those kinds of things? Well, to, to, to be honest, I've always, from before, the first uh, time I arrived in America, I've always had the thought the people that I met were the salt of the earth. Uh, they were, uh, they went uh, to great lengths to look after you, uh, to uh, ensure what you needed in terms of trying to do your job in America uh, uh, happened. And uh, I just, I found the people amazing. And I think there were a lot of people you said to yourself when you were thinking about it, these people are deeply committed to the Irish Republican struggle. Yes, uh, the hate splats for many made up in the trigger uh, that, that, that set, it, set it off. Uh, they didn't have to do with it, their, what they were doing because they were 5,000 miles away from uh, the Jeez. thing, but they done it willingly. And I have to say, they were hard, not only in, uh, for Republicans, the Republican struggle, but they were hard working individuals and families who give a few hours a day or a week and came out and made the difference. And America always makes a difference. And especially as we move towards uh, the a United Ireland, America is going to be crucial and has been crucial in ensuring that that will happen. Now, uh, I, I have to ask this, of all the places that you've been to in the States, uh, what is the, uh, what is one of just your favorite, one, what is one of your favorite places here? Well, I have this thing, and it was, uh, it was uh, I always regret this. Uh, and coming to Christmas 1976, 1976, yes, no, sorry, 1980, uh, 76 is when I went down to jail. When I was out in bail, one of the, one of the things that happened uh, with myself is that the uh, people in America, uh, we're bringing Irish Republicans across who had, had done time. Uh, you were losing them fairly uh, quickly. Uh, they make it a couple of wee trips in in terms of where they traveled to in America. Uh, but if they, when they were caught, they were out. They were deported within a couple of days. Sure. And uh, so, I when I got when I got arrested, and, and that's. Karen will tell you that's a, that's another story all together. You know, it was <laughs> it was it was like watching a film on TV. I think that the 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 arrest itself. But uh, what had happened was that uh, when when I got arre arrested, uh, I was about 15, 16, maybe more, seventeen days in a place called the Flushing Detention Center, which is an immigration holding center, but also moved to the Manhattan Correctional Center in the middle of Manhattan. <coughs> and they couldn't believe it. The, the officials ended up refused to accept this because we're two illegal immigrants. And uh, the British had been, they told us openly, like the British, the immigration agents told us, says, we would never arrest people like yourselves coming in. And uh, he says, but he's created too many waves. And the British have been on to the government and we've been told to get you out of here. And part of that was holding us in the maximum security prison. <coughs> but so, uh, and I got and when I got released, I got released on thirty thousand dollars bail. And uh, it's uh, when I got released, uh, the, I got deported. Was uh, issued with the de deportation. The judge that says you're deported. And uh, he, he looked at me and he says, "Did you ever think of a plan for political asylum?" And uh, my solicitor was a guy called Frank Durkin, whose uh, uncle was Paul O'Dwyer, uh, who had stood for a thing. Two wonderful people here. And uh, Frank, Frank Durkin looked at me and I looked at him and I nodded my head and Frank says, we'll have the papers ready this, this afternoon. And the judge says, you're released on $30,000 bail. And, and that was it. That was my release. So what you had in me as somebody who didn't have to worry about traveling about America, there was no chance of me getting arrested. Because I was out in, uh, out in uh, 
sick of the planning all the same. To to wrap up your your time here, um, and and I'm I'm just kind of curious if if uh, um, if you can talk about it or, or whatnot, but um, it. How do you how do you end up going home? Like how does it like how does your time here then come to an end? You've you've been deported, but you've applied for political asylum, which grants you a very small window. And on the small window, you're traveling uh, a lot, uh, trying yeah. to, to kind of get out there and raise the word. But at some point in time, it's got to come to an end. So, um, kind of tell us tell us about that. Well, it uh, was the first hunger strike took place in uh, October 1980. Yeah. Uh, I was there then, and that's what one of the things we were building up towards. It was inevitable uh, because of the increasing conditions and the beatings that uh, that uh, there already had been. When I was there in prison, they were already talking about a hunger strike, and people pleaded, I would say, pleaded with the prisoners not to take that step. But it became inevitable uh, because of all the conditions and the beatings in the, in the, in the jail. So I think it been the 18th of October. Uh, that the first hunger strike began, and uh, that increased uh, the 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 push to to, to, uh, to, to begin. And I, I came back. I think it was the twenty first of December. <coughs> there was a uh, institute meeting down in uh, in the around uh, the UN buildings in America, and it was to take place on the church hall uh, just beside it. And I was walking down uh, through Manhattan, heading down to, uh, to, uh, towards it. And for the first time in many, many years from what I was told uh, there, that you had uh, the advertisements for the newspapers, the New York Daily News, New York Times, all their, 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 the, the, the posters they put on the lamps advertising the paper said hunger striker near the death. And that was the first time that at that level you had uh, that, 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 that there. So, that, and, and when you're dealing with obviously with that type of media, you know, thing, and I got down, I was heading down. Obviously, there was a, 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 a you were panicking because uh, one of your comrades was very close to death. So, you had the, you were poisoned. So, I was going down to do that meeting. <coughs> I'd, uh, I went down and phoned. Uh, a, a, a friend from America who was organizing, helping to organize the, the, the trip. And I said, uh, as soon as I got on the phone, it says, get their place right away. Uh, the media are carrying that the hunger strike is coming to an end. It's over. So I didn't know it. I, nobody really knew what was happening because uh, no mobile phones, no contact. The only thing you relied on was uh, stopping in the street. And they usually used that, uh, obviously, for security things to his uh, phone from a, a, a public telephone. And uh, <clears throat> then when I got down, we got a bit of a briefing on what had happened and uh, the, the hunger strike was over. So I waited about a few days. I'd done a number of meetings trying to brief people on what was happening. And uh, now, and I got a phone call from Aaron says, I think it's about time to come home. Okay. And uh, so that was okay. So what I had to do was uh, surrender myself to get my passport and get my thing. So I went down to the immigration place and they said to me, look, we're going to have to hold you. Uh, we'll have you on a flight out tonight. I says, well, see, to be honest, I says, I haven't got any of my stuff. I, I would like to try and get a couple of things for my family. And I told him, he said, he looked at me, he says, do you think I can trust you? And I says, well, I'm here. I came in the south. The police was going. He says, that's okay. We'll see you in the airport in the night at nine o'clock. So I went on off and I went down met friends just to tell them that I was leaving that, that night. And I went to the airport that night. And uh, I think I was about the 23rd of December. And uh, it ended up, uh, uh, there was two immigration uh, agents waiting on me. And uh, pop, walked me to the, the, the plane, put me on the plane, and I was away home. But uh, I, I thought, and it's very rarely you get the Christmassy feeling. And the place where I got the Christmassy feeling was in the Bronx. You know, it was powerful. Really? Uh, the, the two people, you no, know, the way people you know, greeted each other, you know, I went down maybe for a couple of beers, and 
it only really happened one day a year, but they were uh, saying happy Christmas. And everybody was, and here's me, my God, and I just felt Christmas or what Christmas is all about, you know. And uh, I was sorry I came home at that time. I should have stayed uh, for Christmas. It was two people I was staying with uh, that both are dead now. And uh, they were wonderful human beings. They never had any children. So I near enough, I, I became a, a part of their household in, the, in the four months or so that I was there. <laughs> and, and that was it. And I rang Belfast on Christmas Eve, which made matters worse. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I got to tell you, I can't thank you enough for your time. Uh, I can't thank you enough for sharing your story with us. Um, I meant what I said earlier, like you could, your life of, of activism and, and, and whatnot is a thing where we could do, you know, we could do these interviews just on, on very small chunks uh, and hearing about them. And I'm, I apologize for, uh, for uh, not allowing your story to go a little bit further because there's, uh, there's a lot there to talk about. But I would like to bring you back because the one thing that we haven't gotten to is when you come back from the States, you, you go into community activism and you've been an elected, you've served uh, on the Belfast Council, uh, um, you, um, you've served uh, admirably several times and, and really spent a lot like helping your community like build itself oh, yes. and, and move on. And, and I think that story needs to be told. So we're going to have to have you back for that. See, I think, I think the, just, a, just a, a comment that, you know, that uh, many people when they look uh, at uh, Irish Republicans or the IRA or Sinn Féin at that time, you know, the uh, the, the, the wasn't uh, the armed struggle was it, at that time uh, was uh, essential. Uh, but uh, what you had in the, uh, behind the scenes was uh, Republicans actively working within their own communities, trying to make life better for the people in those communities. Uh, poverty was rife. Uh, conditions in many of the houses uh, were. Uh, were, were, were difficult and um, where I had lived at the time was a huge lack of flats uh, were a thousand flats in it and uh, so uh, I'd become involved there but certainly I would love to come back and and uh, the the just do whatever yeah that you need me to do and, and then I, I you just made a comment and it, and it rang through we have had several people when they do these interviews talk about the things that they have done in their community jazz you know jazz went in to education and and uh you know people made comments about bobby getting out and organizing uh his community before going back in and whatnot and it just literally dawned on me with the way that you worded how many people we have talked to um who have gone who have been involved in their community and trying to make it better. And, and I, it, it, I'm embarrassed to say that I hadn't actually made that connection as broadly as, as what I just did um, because of the comment that you made. So I definitely want to have you back. I think that's great. Uh, I think it'd be a lot of fun to hear about it and, and do uh, and do those things. So I want to say thank you again for taking the time to, to be with us today for sharing. And, and um, I think it's an amazing story. Um, and I will look forward to seeing you again uh, very soon. Well, can I, can I say one thing, Jay? You know, thank, you. thank you to you uh, for, 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 the, for this interview. Uh, because I've always thought that uh, I, I never really got to thank all the people uh, who had helped me uh, and stayed with, supported us. And uh, uh, through the, 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 it's, I've always wanted to be able uh, through some venue or thing is to uh, just thank people uh, without their help, uh, without their work and without their dedication and determination, you know, we'd have been a, a lot further back in the struggle. And uh, well, I, uh, I think that's wonderful. Uh, I think it's, um, I think it's great to know that we have gotten to play a part and I think it's great to know that we continue to play a part as we move forward. I, I, I think that's, that's amazing. So, uh, thank you again. We'll we'll make time and then get you back and and uh, kind of go through some other things and and talk a little bit more. It's been a lot of fun and and uh, I love hearing your stories. Uh, I, I absolutely love hearing your stories. They just uh, some of them make me laugh and some of them make me cringe. And but every single time, I feel like I'm a better man for for having been a part of it. So thank you, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, 
And as for everyone else, uh, I, I always say, please share these videos. Please send them around. Please uh, you know, share them with your Hibernian division. Share them with uh, your friends and your family. Everybody has that one uncle um, that really enjoys this side of his uh, heritage and whatnot. And, and uh, these videos are meant to kind of inform and to bring us all together. Um, so we're looking forward to a great 2022. And uh, until next time, slong.